Hey everyone, this is uh, Colin Travis. You're tuned in to Art Talk Session 17, and we are joined today by a very special guest, Marco Djurjevic. Marco, if you uh, want to say hey to everyone. Hey everyone. Hey, how's it all going? So Marco, we usually like to start uh, by going back to like your, your humble beginnings. You know, what, what initially like inspired you to get hey, everyone? Hey everyone. Hey, how's it all going? Whoa. Uh, sorry, that was a stupid reverb. <laughs> okay, so what inspired me initially? Jesus, man, you're starting way early. Um, I don't know, He-Man, The Last Unicorn, stuff that was on TV, um, things that I wanted to draw that, you know, uh, I liked from watching cartoons, um, I guess. That, that was the, the initial Kickstarter. And pretty much, you know, Anything related to to toys, I think toys were a big thing for me. Toys, toys, like models or something. Like, uh, was it? Like, did you just think it was? Cool? I, mean, I was I was exposed to He Man when I was like six years old or five years old. So like that that is my is one of my earliest memories in terms of toys. Um, but then later on, it would be like different different things like GI Joe or mask or. Like, I'm, I'm a complete child of the 80s, Transformers and stuff. Okay, so, like, when did you, uh, when did you decide to, like, you know, pick up a pencil and be like, oh, well, let's, uh, let's try drawing some of this stuff, or... Oh, I've been actually working, I mean, I've been drawing all my life, as far as I remember. I, I, I just never stopped, I guess, you know? There was always, there was always, um, you know, something um, for me to do. Yeah, yeah, I get that for sure. And uh, what point did you decide to like be like, okay, I'm gonna take this seriously and pursue it like as a as a career? I think if I remember correctly, I mean, like I made my first money when I was like a three, four year old because my my parents owned a tennis club and they had like rich guests coming over playing tennis during summer. And uh, I would walk around with a with a pen between their legs and start drawing faces on their legs, and they would buy me ice cream for it. So that was the <laughs> very first money. Man. Um, but eventually, I think everything started off when I was fifteen, and there was a in my hometown there was a small comic book store that opened up and it carried a bunch of RPGs as well. And I was a regular guest there because. They had all these beautiful illustrated books and comic books that I've never seen before. Um, and they carry tons of image comics and they carry tons of really awesome RPGs. Um, and I knew the owner and the owner introduced me to a bunch of players and I brought some of my art in and one of the players was requesting his RPG character to be drawn. Um, and it was like a, a stupid ranger character with a, with a ferret. <laughs> and uh, I, I drew that thing and then I came in the next day and it was like a black and white pen drawing and I came in the next day uh, and gave it to him he asked me what I wanted for it and I was completely flabbergasted that somebody would offer money for it um, and so I said 50 bucks just because I thought he's never going to pay that and he instantly paid me for it um, oh. so that was the first actual drawing on paper that I sold and that was a moment where I was like, oh, man, I, I'm actually, you know, I'm making cash with this. This was the easiest 50 bucks that I ever made. Um, <laughs> and, so, and so this is that, <laughs> that, that launched the idea in my head of trying to do this profession. But it then took me another year and a half to actually find a job. And the first job I found was at an RPG company in, in Germany. Um, and they had like like back in the '90s, <clears throat> they would print like the, the 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 address into the editorial with phone numbers and everything because it was really common. Um, you would you know call up a, a publisher and ask them for work. And, um, I, I had like a I had like a very preferred RPG line that I was following, um, and I, I looked into the editorial and I. I decided, okay, I'm just going to call the art director and see if I can get an appointment. And I was like 16 and a half, 17 at that time. Um, it was in 96, so I was 17. Mm -hmm. I called.
called him up and I asked him if, you know, like actually he picked up and I was like, hey, I'm the 17 year, year old illustrator. I, I love your books, but I think I'm better than all the guys that you're hiring. <laughs> Can I bring my portfolio over? And he laughed at the phone. And he was like, he didn't understand where I was going with this, but I was really convincing about it. And I, was, I said, I just need this chance. I need to show you my portfolio. I need to, I need to get it, get a, you know, a stint of this. And he agreed to me coming over for an appointment the week after. And so this was in a different city, so 200 miles away. So I had to buy a train ticket, and I, I, I put all kinds of originals together, and I prepared for the meeting, and I bought like a really huge portfolio uh, where I would slide all the originals in. Um, drove out there, went to his office, put the portfolio down, and instantly got hired. Um, oh. So I had my like on my, the spot like that. <laughs> on the spot. Like he, he loved the stuff. He thought it was incredible for a 17 year old. Um, he offered me, uh, he offered to buy three pieces right away out of my portfolio that he wanted to use on, on, on an upcoming book. And he replaced a bunch of other illustrations with my artwork. And then he became a regular. And so I think like three weeks later, he offered me the first book to be you know, done entirely by myself. Uh, which com which consisted of 60 black and white illustrations and a cover. Um, mm -hmm. And it was the perfect summer job. It took me like six weeks during, you know, uh, uh, summer vacation time to finish the thing. And I remember the, the paycheck that I got was like um, roughly two and a half thousand dollars. But that was more than any other 17 year old would get. <laughs> it was incredible. I was doing I was doing my hobby, um, and I was getting paid for it. And and I, I literally I couldn't believe the amount of money that I was getting. I didn't know anything about pricing back then. I didn't know that I was undercutting everybody with this. But <laughs> I, I I felt like I I was so proud of this. I, I felt like oh wow, this is my this is a career path that I really want to go down because like now I can buy all the paints and all the inks that I ever needed. Uh, and even all the crayons that are never used. So I took the paycheck into, into an art supply store. <laughs> I just blew the entire paycheck on art supplies that I never used. Um, just because I wanted to see, like, I wanted to own all, all the different colored pencils. I wanted to own all the different crayons, <laughs> all the different papers. And I thought it's like really important. It's like part of my career to have like everything available whenever I need it. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the shop was super happy, um, and um, yeah, that was that was the story of that. And then, literally from there, it went onward. So, since you, uh, I'm, I'm working, I'm, I've been working professionally so 21, 21 years now. Wow! You said there was about a year and a half gap between when you uh, applied at the, or took your portfolio to the RPG company and uh, no, no, it was a year and a half gap between selling that very first piece in the comic store okay. and then applying to the RPG company. Um, so what, what did you do in order to like, you know, did you just do a bunch of drawings and say, Hey, uh, let's I, just, I just wasn't brave enough to do it earlier. Like it, it took me, it took me a ton of courage to pick up the phone and actually call in. Um, oh. I think that was, the, that was the main reason. Uh, uh, during this time, like, uh, were you uh, like studying Hogarth before your first drawing? Oh, yeah. Like you were learning oh, yeah. fundamentals? Yeah, I've been, I've been looking at Hogarth. I mean, when I was 12, 13, like that was, that was a big inspiration when I was really young. Um, I tried to understand it right out of the books, even though like none of the writing made sense. And my English was terribly broken. I, I just couldn't make, make out what he was writing about or what he was trying to say, but I, I really liked the expressiveness of the figure. I really have to say that even today, like I look at I look at his drawings much more as a guideline than something to imitate. You know, it's like a it's like a you know it's like a very expressive gesture, um, and I, I, I keep very fond memories of of being exposed to his work uh, when I was younger. We actually have a community question about Hogarth. Uh, Raphael Inspirations is wanting to know: uh, Would you still, to this day, recommend Hogarth as like a base for anatomy? I, I do because what he teaches you is to, you know, apply the figure in free space and do whatever you want with it. Um, 
what a lot of the other anatomy books do is they show you exactly how to draw a model. <laughs> and <laughs> I, find that, I find that very limiting because like you're not in front of that model, you're drawing somebody else's interpretation of that model. Um, so you're learning someone else's interpretation of that certain model that he drew to teach you anatomy, but at the same time, you're not learning what the understructure of the gesture is about. And like, I really feel if Hogarth does one thing right, it, it is to teach you the playfulness of the figure, to place it in any kind of space, in any kind of room, in any kind of situation, to give you um, extreme forms of movement, to give you extreme forms of body weight, and so forth and so forth. And um, there is a certain playfulness that you know, like helps you in constructing the, the, the human figure but then obviously you, over time, you have to layer your own experiences over the knowledge that you gathered from Hogarth um, and, and become your own thing um, and, and layer your own personal perception over, over that grid work that you're learning from him. But as a general starter, I really think he's incredibly powerful and playful and, and, and imaginative and um, definitely gives you a different angle than most of the other um, and out of the books that I've seen over the years. Yeah, we mostly were rooted in uh, Loomis's work, and I've recently been looking into Hogarth because I knew that was like part of your like you know foundation as an artist. And like looking at like you know his stuff compared to Loomis, like they're both good, of course. But uh, Loomis has like these sections, like say if you take figure drawing, it's like standing pose, running pose, jumping pose, whatever. But then if you look at like Hogarth, it was more like yeah, it was more like about a. Uh, like you said, the playfulness of the figure and flexing it in free space. And it, it felt, uh, I, I don't know, it, it was actually kind of a dramatic shift. Like looking at his illustrations, I think some people get a little turned off because they're very exaggerated. Oh, but, hell yeah. Like I hear, I hear the same complaint all the time, but she's not realistic. Yeah, but like, no, 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 no nobody's asking you to draw <laughs> like him. People, like, I'm, I'm just asking you to look at the thing at face value and see the see the potential that it has for you to learn how to move the figure on your own. Yeah. If you, you know, like if you're, if you're interested enough to do that, like if you're more interested in taking photo reference, if you're more interested in having an actual model sit for you and light it all out, then please, you know, be my guest, do your, do your own way. I'm just saying that there is a lot of, a lot of potential in Hogarth if you're trying to draw the figure from an imaginative standpoint and, and, and to give it life, to breathe like weight into it. And, yeah, you know. has, he has like a lot more energy and gesture in his like that yeah. I really noticed compared to like something like Bridgman or Loomis. And that doesn't mean you have to draw like him or you have to draw the same faces or the same hands or the same yeah. you know, overall body shape. It just means use it as a, as a framework for any experience that you want to layer over it. Yeah, it's a, it's not it's a it's a blueprint. It's not about replication. Like you know, yeah. if you want to if you want to replicate it, then just you know <laughs> replicate. But that's not going to help you in working from like you said, flexing the form in free space. Exactly. That's correct. Definitely agree. Uh, uh, so going back to your uh, like early uh, work with like doing the RPG stuff, was that was that like a pretty big like uh, uh, inspiration point for your Degenesis project? I mean, I grew up with RPGs. I've been playing RPGs since I was 13. Like, I really, I really love that hobby more than anything. Um, I unfortunately don't play these days anymore, but like, I, I used to spend my entire teenager dumb almost playing every weekend. Um, and I was exposed to the first big illustrators I was exposed to RPGs. So um, I, I remember fondly, you know, coming across Tim Bradstreet's work or Josh Timbrook's work or Andrew Robinson's work in, in my early RPG days because you know there was a in the early 90s there was like some some sort of golden age of good RPG illustrators that later on became comic book artists and all kinds of different concept artists. But during that time period they were all kind of doing RPG artwork. And um, I, I really, I really loved them for their work and that got me into, into taking illustration a lot more serious because what I liked about illustration from the very beginning was you have to start, you have to tell a story in just one shot. Uh, that's it, you only have that one shot. So you need to figure out what is important, what is not important. What is, what are you gonna omit? What are you gonna keep in? What are you gonna, uh, you know, 
exaggerate where you're going to take the story, what can you use as a field of interpretation, and then from that perspective, you know, how can you how can you translate that to the viewer to make it exciting? So it's not just a repetition of the of the actual text that is already written out, but it's actually bringing something new to the table. Um, and that inspired me a lot about illustration. That's why why I felt like this was a definitive uh, a definitive career path to take in, in the very beginning. Yeah, so going back to where, like when you finished that book uh, and then you were like, okay, this is a viable career, like what were your like next steps forward like, and kind of taking us through your career history? I mean, I, I, did, I did spend a fair amount of time with that company in particular. I spent like three years with them and then I started to branch out into different areas. And I think it was about 99 that I finally looked up to the internet um, and I was able to send applications um, to foreign companies outside of Germany. So, and then I started like shipping my portfolio to the States because I wanted to work for certain companies like FASA and White Wolf were really big back then. Um, and I, I got work from them, but like, what was really terrible was that the RPG industry in general, they didn't have like a very, you know, a very good system for illustrators to actually make money. Like the pay was always bad and the pay the, the, the time you have to wait for an invoice to clear was terribly long. And so sometimes I would just like really starve the shit out of myself. And, um, I, I only made it through long, long periods of time by having the help of friends who would lend me money. And then by the time the paycheck would arrive, then I would have to pay them back. And then I was without money again. And I had to <laughs> let new cash and couch surf a lot. And it was a really it was a really depressing time, and I, I remember a good friend of mine who was a caricature artist. I think he still is. Um, he he was he was literally hammering me. That was must have been around two thousand three. He was hammering me to post some concert art. Like he he, he was uh, you know besieging me over like over over showing my, my artwork there. I mean, he was like, you have to do this, you have to do this, and I I honestly I. I've never seen a community of artists that big. You know, I just didn't know what it was all about. And it was like um, so huge, and a lot of artists that I really admired posted there. Um, John Foster, for example, and Dan Milligan, uh, Coral Kaufman, and, uh, Andrew Jones. And I, I really, I, I, I just didn't know what to do. And like, I was pondering over the idea of posting there for, I think it must have been a week. And I, I looked at the artwork that I was doing compared to the artwork they were doing and nothing matched up. I was just like a, I was a, I was a good pencil artist. I didn't know anything about color. I never painted a piece in my life. I did some ink work here and there. I thought I'm not going to impress anybody over there. Nobody's going to give a fuck about post. Uh, and then eventually one morning it just hit me and I just decided, okay, let, let, let's just show what I, what, uh, let's just see what reaction I would have. All the reactions were positive. Everything that came in was really, really positive. The, the, the thread literally caught the attention of pretty much everyone that I admired there. And uh, there was tons of compliments raining in, lots of private messages. And um, I was really, really excited about it. And then what was really funny was that instantly off of that, like Mass Black, which was just in foundational days, they instantly reached out to me and they asked me if I wanted to jump on board as their um, senior character artist, and that was that was the biggest um, the biggest career jump in one go from like one place of not being able to pay rent to a place where I would have like steady salary and you yeah. know affordable lifestyle. Um, uh, and I, I hired on. I, I moved to the states and spent a, a good a good amount of time with them, uh, two and a half three years almost till two thousand six. Which is when Marvel approached me, and then they offered they offered to put me under an exclusive, and I was in a in a changing I was in a position of change. I was about to move back to Europe, want to get married, um, and I needed work. Um, and Marvel offered a really good deal, a really good exclusive contract. Um, they just wanted to keep me on board. Uh, for a very long period of time, they were really happy with the few samples that I've, I've done for them. Um, and uh, eventually, that contract became like five years long. And 
then that was the entire Marvel time right there. Yeah. And in 2010, I felt like, okay, now it's time to do something different again. So this is like seven years ago, and I, I was missing my guys from San Francisco. I was missing the work that I had in the studio. I was missing hanging out with people like Wes and Knox on a daily basis in camp. Um, they were all my friends, but they were all, all were predominantly artists. Um, and they were really responsible for my artistic growth in, in that time period. Also my art director, Coro. Um, I, I felt like I was in that bubble of a freelancer where you're just not having the, the artistic interaction with other artists um, that is very healthy and is also very challenging, motivating. Um, because you're only as good as the next best guy. Um, and so I felt like it was maybe time to step up and, and just do something similar. But since I was in Berlin, I needed to start from scratch. So I decided, okay, let's just open up a company. And I didn't know where, where I was going, but then eventually it, it meandered into what it is today, which is like a, a, a relatively big outsourcing studio. Like we're, we're at uh, 20 people now. and. Uh, I don't know. I guess we'll keep on growing for quite some time. I mean, that's that's incredible. Like you know, the fact that you like you know able to climb that rat ladder through that time, and then you kind of come back to where you know you want to do things like with your new IPs and stuff that you're doing. Kind of goes back to the roots of your RPG days and kind of a. Well, yeah. I mean, like it goes back to world building, I guess. And I think that, like a lot of a lot of illustrators in general, like when they when they start out, they come with the they enter this world with the idea of like, I, I just want to, I just really want to create the ideas that I had as a child and make them come to life. And, um, and then somewhere during the process, like paying bills and doing client work and, and, and uh, you know, making sure that you're networking properly and making sure that, you know, like your, your um, a family is fed, like people lose sight of what made them start to do this in the first place. And I, I really didn't want to go that route. I really felt like it was time for me, you know, to do to do something for myself and, and to accomplish the things that I set out in, in life. And it's just finishing projects, you know, like for me, like one of the main things right now is just to finish as many projects that I have, you know, been lying around in my drawers for many, many years. And, um, you know, I, I feel like they haven't been brought to completion in a way. And, uh, it's a lot of unfinished business that I'm trying to take care of at this point. Uh, definitely. Uh, this actually, I have a question that wanted to run by you uh, that was kind of from the community. Um, yeah. Hold on one second here. Let's see what it was. Yeah, I said uh, you're like when it came to you like breaking into the industry and like you know kind of just you know getting things around and, and just improving in art in general said, well, what's your approach to get good at drawing aside from volume of drawings? Uh, things to think about, good exercises? Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, like, I, I do feel like the volume of drawing is, is, is particularly important because everything that you repeat, you get better at. Everything that you do more than once, you get better at. Whenever you hit the mindset of, I really want to get this done, then people get really good. Um, but besides that, obviously, it's also taking in new inspirations. If you're just trying to look for inspiration within the artistic community that you're trying to, you know, make it in, then, then you're pretty much limited to that artistic community and to that kind of input. You need to have different kinds of input. Like, I feel like people are too narrow-minded when it comes to where they're getting their inspiration from. Like they need to have a much broader vision towards you know, taking new things in and, and sucking up new kinds of information. Um, I, I do feel like that's a very limiting factor. Also, you know, like another limiting factor is to, you know, constantly look out for, you know, how good you are in relation to other people. That is not a thing that you should measure yourself by. You should measure yourself by your own standards. You know, like you should be the challenging bar for yourself you cannot look around and say like no this i'm now better than this guy and now i'm leveling up towards this guy that's bullshit like that doesn't lead anywhere because there's always going to be somebody who's better than you um 
the, the, the just is such a it's such a weird mindset. It's not not a competition. Like if anything, you should have yourself as the standard of all things, and you should be trying to be the best you can be for yourself. And if you if you manage to do that, then you're actually doing something very authentic. Then you're confronting yourself with your shortcomings and with your own, uh, you know, with your own ambitions and with your own motivations. And then you can create something really, really powerful out of that. But if you're constantly looking at, you know, who you're beating at each week and how good you are in comparison to other people, it's like um, you're treating art like it's a high school match, you know, like a, you know, it's a beauty match or, or you know, a frat house match, but like it's not, it's not art. <laughs> So, like those those things are definitely the ones that I I'm All right, that's I'm I'm highly uh, considering as, as as problematic in your artistic growth. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like I, I was that was something that Cole and I have been talking about more lately about like you know it, it's important to like I, I get I, it's it can be a good thing of course you know to see like other art and you know use that but at the same time at the end of the day you should be your own standard so you should not spend so much time looking on the internet as to what other people are doing and go back to kind of your roots of, you know, saying, I'm I mean, wrong. You can, you can totally look at what other people are doing. When, like, it's a, like it's a, it's a wrong approach to measure yourself by those people. Like you yeah. should measure yourself by yourself. That's the only standard that exists. Like it, it's, as soon as you try to make other people a benchmark for yourself and you're, you're, you're fooling yourself and you're making it a competition and it's not very healthy. Mm, 100%. Uh, going back to uh, uh, like 2003 real quick, uh, I, I remember reading somewhere that that was like actually when you first like uh, came up with like the uh, Degenesis IP like with a buddy of yours and then I, I read that like you had let it sit for almost like a decade and yeah. then just revisited it. Like could you tell us like a little bit about like what that was like to find that people were still like into it and actually playing it and like... Oh hell yeah. I mean like when we, when we did the original idea, we were two 24 year old uh, greenhorns that had no <laughs> idea about polishing. Like we were, we were a really shitty garage band uh, with no idea of how to, you know, put up a, or put out a book. It was like, it came out of, it came out of the need to do something. And since we weren't making a lot of money, we just felt like, okay, maybe if we write our own RPG, then we're going to make some. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then we published it, and it was a mediocre success. Like, we, we managed to live off the profits for about a year. Um, but then eventually, you know, like, we had no plan B. Like, nothing, nothing was established. We had no idea how to license the thing. We didn't know what to do with it outside of, you know, the small German community that we made it for. And we, we kind of lost it there. And I think, you know, it meandered off into two different directions. Chris kept on you know, writing for it for, I think, a year or two longer. Um, and I I was at that point already in the States, and um, I couldn't care less for it at that point because I really saw it as a, almost like a, as a, as a failure, you know, like in a way, because we never had managed to actually do something with it. And 10 years later, it so happens that I, I just, you know, I was Googling the game and I checked out the, the old forums that we established, and there were still people playing it after 10 years, and people building cosplay costumes off of it, off of the original designs that I made. And I, I was overwhelmed from an emotional side. I was like, I felt like it was such a strong impression to see, you know, like all these people really being still invested in it. And I looked at the old stuff, and I showed it around to a few guys in my studio, and they also really liked it. They felt like there was something really true about it. And then it was a really funny conversation I had with Dave, um, where he was where he was urging me I should just bring it back. And I felt like, oh my god, like he, like that <laughs> one idea crossed me so many times. And and then I called my old partner Chris up, and I was like, what if we just redo this? What if we just reboot it in a way where you know, like now we're older, 10 years later, we have much more experience. We know things much better than we did it before. Do you want to do this? And he was, he was cool with it. He felt like it's a good idea. And then we just started working right away. I felt like there was something that needed to get out of my system. You know? um, 
Yeah, it was great. It was great to reboot it. It was great to revisit it, and I think it's um, great to keep on working on it. We just published a just published a third book. Um, since I guess that was an expansion, like the killing. Yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, it, it keeps me occupied. It, uh, it gives me something to do in my free time, and um, mm -hmm. I, I like. And this is what I said earlier. I have. I feel like I have a lot of unfinished business. A lot of old ideas that have never been brought to completion on um, a lot of stuff that is rotting in my in my drawer that I want to just keep on bringing back. I just want to use the next decade or so to just you know put up things that I, I, I dreamed about when I was younger and I never had the chance to put up. And uh, um, the chance is just, you know, one, that was the first launch project, but there's a lot more uh, lying there just waits for me to be you know, taken out and worked on. Um, actually, this is a good question that kind of corresponds with that from Incognit. He said, I've been working on my own IP for a while and I was wondering in a case of world building, what is for you the best place to start? Like where did you, I don't know, pick up with the Genesis and say, okay, here's a really good starting, starting point, let's spiral outward from here. Well, I mean, the best stories are the ones that you can summarize in in a couple of sentences, the genesis is about God falls on the planet, realizes, you know, mankind has been fucking around with Garden and has to reset it. <laughs> and there you go. And that's the whole that's the whole plot of the Genesis described in a nutshell. Uh, and then you start like meandering from there and you, you define your protagonists and you define your conflict and you define you know, like the intricacies of the of the of the world, and you just meander into different directions. But obviously, I mean, like, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways about, to go about it. Like, um, do you want to like you have to decide what kind of story it's supposed to be? Who's the who's the person you're witnessing that story through? Um, an RPG is an incredibly wide and open terrain for an IP builder. Um, to start off with, you know, because you're like looking at the entire spectrum of everything that's happening from a very wide angle. And sometimes it's much easier to just go into character level and develop a character whose eyes are basically the eyes into that world and everything that we experience is through that person's eyes. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have a much more narrow view and you don't need to figure out as much as we have to figure out with Genesis, which is like a 700 page quarter pounder with cheese that nobody wants to <laughs> read because it's so massive. Um, so like that that's like working your way through a telephone book. Nobody needs that. You know, like it's it's highly inaccessible. Uh, sometimes it's much easier to go with a simple story and, and just explain it through the eyes of the character and you know, uh, you know uh, develop the world on the fly as as if you're as if you're witnessing everything that very moment through the character's eyes. And um, uh, it's a much easier route, but like everybody has to figure that out for themselves. The, the most important part is like keep it simple. Keep it simple and just get like start being complicated. Once the, the story really works in a, in a simple fashion in a few sentences, then you can start meandering around and like build like all these sideways to it and, and, and but never fluctuate away from what the core story is. Because if you look at like all the big you look at all the big IPs that are out there, they have a very strong core story that can be told in just a few sentences. Yeah, um, I was about to mention that. Like any of the, some of the best movies or video games or anything like that, you know, it's like if it has a thematic or an idea, it's always condensed in like a couple sentences. Yeah. You know, and then yeah. from there, it's built outward. So it gives you like an immediate directive and to say, okay, now I can explore basically what I'll rotate. And um, besides that, I mean, like one of the main factors is actually to keep the motivation up and to to actually keep on working on it. Like I, I really think discipline is a far bigger factor than anything else. Like imagination, everybody has imagination. Imagination comes in you know plenty uh, of different ways. People have ideas all the time, but like most of the time, they just have the idea. They don't have the willpower to sit down and actually work it out. Uh, and I think willpower and discipline are just like major factors to, to getting something done. Um, what is highly annoying is that people will tell you about an idea that they had, and the moment they tell you about it, 
they've already talked themselves out of the idea and they're never going to pick it up. Like how many times I remember, have I heard people walking into my office or meeting them at conventions and they're like, I want to do this IP. Yeah. Like, what keeps you from it? Like, why don't you do it? Like, well, like you just told me your idea, but like, well, do you need, do you need me to pay you for it to do it? Or do you, what, what kind of incentive do you need to get started? And that is a, that is a highly problematic, uh, situation because most people don't develop the motivation that it takes to be disciplined about it. And I understand why, because everything in life is pretty hard, especially when you have to repeat it over and over again. If you want to, if you want to be a fucking superstar bodybuilder or, you know, uh, an ultimate fighter, you're not going to do that in a, in, a, in a night or in a week or uh, in a couple of months. You just have to put a lot of work in there. And to be able to put a lot of work in that, you need to keep on motivating yourself over and over again. So you need to build incentives for yourself. And the best is to have milestones, you know? Like I, for example, when I, when I was working on the Genesis, I knew the project is so vast and will take two years to complete. So before I even started painting a single image, I tried to sketch it all out at least. So I would see the, I would see the whole project in a very rough stage. Um, where I knew, okay, this is not going to take me that long. I can sketch it all out in probably a month and a half. And then I have like two years of rendering in front of me <laughs> that I need to go through. But at least, you know, you have like the, the, the great, the, the, the greater picture, the bigger picture right in front of you. And then you just keep on working it off in small batches and you gratify yourself for every small batch that you, that you achieve to, you know, keep or every milestone you keep for yourself. And, um, yeah. That's yeah. about, I think that's about about then, like, the development process kind of becomes like the incentive as you're building it. And yeah. that actually leads into a good uh, question from one of the, uh, the uh, viewers. Uh, Joseph Weston uh, asks, uh, Dave Ritposa talks about you having like a, a crazy work ethic. How many hours a day are you, you drawing and working on these projects, would you say? I mean, like, it's not, I mean, my work ethic is, is crazy because I have to do a lot of different things during during the day. So, like, I run the studio, I, I do a lot of managerial tasks that have nothing to do with art. So, I, you know, I write emails, I do payroll, I uh, make sure our bookkeeping is uh, up to date, I uh, do interviews with artists and interns, I, uh, you know, help out on the customer service. Um, there's a million tasks in a day that I have to do that have nothing to do with art. And then besides that, I'm also trying to be, the, you know, a halfway good boss and have an open ear for anybody who wants to talk or anybody who wants, you know, some advice. So, um, the first six hours of the day, just go into that. And then by around six o'clock, when people start leaving the office, this is where I get into my creative zone and then I, I just simply, I keep working till midnight, um, sometimes till one o'clock, uh, and then I go home. And, and then for me, like my, the most sacred things are weekends because on weekends I don't have to solve anyone's problem. Nobody calls me, I don't get emails, nobody gives a fuck about me existing. And then I come <laughs> into the office and I just get like insane amounts of work done because I just can pull a 16 hour shift uh, of, of just drawing. And, and, and that's the, the, the best part. Or sometimes I come in on the weekend and I just do two days of writing um, and I get like 20 pages done um, in a single sitting. And then I'm, I'm super happy because I feel like my, my weekly milestone is done and I can go back to the grinder and just do, do different things. But I was talking about this to, to you, Travis, before, before we went uh, you know, uh, live. Um, you know, it's almost like you're torturing yourself so you crave the act of art so much that once you get to do art, you're like, you don't want to stop doing it. <laughs> just, just keep on crushing it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think you address like a lot of really good points. I mean, you know, the idea of keeping your motivation up and not talking about your projects and, you know, all that, all that whatnot. They be, that was something that I've like, I've realized more lately is that, you know, like, it's like you said, when they, when people talk about, you know, the idea of, you know, trying to go in and do a project or whatever, and they, they explain it to you. It's like they all of a sudden they ride the hype of it in their head and then they talk themselves out of it, you know? So yeah. it's, it's like, Oh, you just got the instant gratification of that rather than just, if you sit down and you do something rather than talk about it, you're going to get a lot more done. And yeah. also with the scheduling, 
avoid social media. Like, you know, just set Facebook. Well, I, don't, I don't. I don't mind it. Like, I, I just. I just don't participate in it. You know, like there's there's you know, times when you, you you know you go online and you celebrate that. <laughs> you know, just set Facebook. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, there was like one thing I saw on Dave's uh, schedule that I used to look at way back when was like he wouldn't look at email or his phone, you know, yeah. for a certain amount. That's more what I was saying. Where it was like, well, if you're trying to really work hard towards something, try to limit your distractions. Mm-hmm. You know, that way. I'm sure you. I'm sure you're probably like a master at it, being like you know, heading a studio and having to you know deal with you know. Just well, like, close the door. <laughs> yeah, close the door. Um. There was, uh, there was, we had a really good, interesting question about like uh, character design because, like, one of the things you're most well known for is like just the amount of designs that you can put out in terms of like costumes. And I think you kind of answered this earlier by just drawing like, you know, characters from the, what was it, the pen and paper role play games and stuff like that, probably like the experience through that. But it said, how do you generate, like, what are the things you think of when you're designing characters? Like, uh, I mean, I, my 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 la- library of, of inspiration is super vast. I, I do take inspiration from all kinds of from all kinds of areas, um, be it historical, be it you know uh, uh, modern, be it you know futuristic. I I do like all kinds of things. I'm not I'm not defined to a certain to a certain style or a certain taste. Um, there's a, you know there's a there's a base realism to it, but it's not like completely set in stone. I, I, I make shit up um, all the time. I, I, I do feel like uh, I, I need to take certain liberties sometimes. Um, but besides that, like it's really just a, a vast inspiration in life because you, where, where else are you going to take your inspiration from, from life? Um, everything is already out there. Everything has already been invented. Everything has already been, been you know, um, uh, uh, created in a way, like you just need to rearrange those ideas and just make something new out of it. That's the that's the main that's the main secret sauce and the main secret ingredient. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Sure. Um, I'm kind of curious about uh, when, whenever you first like uh, decided, like sat down and decided, like, okay, I want to open my own studio and pursue my own IPs. Could you like uh, tell us a little bit about like what the struggles were, like? establishing that and like what the process was of kind of actually like bringing that to fruition yeah i mean like i i did have a a really functional marvel career and there was no reason for me to leave that career but i felt i was trapped in that career um I, i felt like i was working as a freelancer from home um things were going really well for me um I had fantastic editors who took care of me. I had, um, you know, lots of invitation to travel all over the world, and see all kinds of different things, and shake hands with all kinds of different people. Um, but the, there was not a satisfaction of feeling like I'm out in the, you know, dark ocean and I need to leave, to learn how to swim. Um, things were too easy. I would wake up in the morning, I would do a bunch of sketches, I would send them off to my editor, I would get instant approval, I would start painting them, and then I would get applause and money. And that felt like a very boring and incredibly um, spectacular life. Um, (laughs) And Mm -hmm. it felt like something that I needed to break out of because I felt like I was getting lazier and lazier with my ideas, lazier and lazier with my execution, lazier and lazier with my approach to work and instead of challenging myself and growing as an artist, I, I felt like I was, I was degenerating as an artist and, uh, and not making any proper progress. So, so I felt like, you... what is that? Sorry. I thought Cole said something, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just saying like, it was kind of just like too safe of an environment where you got too exactly. comfortable, too complacent. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 I knew from my massive black days at the time that I, I grew the most as an artist was during the, the chance that I had to work in a studio with other artists. So I really felt that was the, the next step for me. I, I wanted to bring a studio of badass artists together and, and um, find the right people to 
to jam and jive with and, and create good things together because that was one of the most inspirational parts of my early career and I felt like I wanted to have that throughout my 30s as well. And that was the, that was the, initial, the initial primer of the whole situation and then you know, like years go by and you have to, you have to, you know, put your team together, you have to find the right people with the right mindset to follow you on this journey because not everybody is, you know, willing to go that route I and mean, everybody's interested in that route and some people are more interested in working in a big company or in a big studio um, and working on franchises and not necessarily on new ideas um, and, you know, seven years in, like, I think, uh, we've kind of brought a good, very good team together at this point that can do a lot of things and has a broad range of, of, of professional expertises. And I mean, I always, I always look up to, you know, the people who went all the way with me. Like there's a few guys that, you know, stayed over the years and are still, you know, part of this group from the, from the very beginning. Like for example, our very first intern, who's now a senior, uh, MJ, um, uh, Macho, she's uh, an incredible guy. Um, he's he's been there from the from the very start, you know. Um, and he went through all the different steps of you know starting out as a classic intern and then taking a chance and uh, really starting to learn and then being hired on as a junior and growing into a junior position and so forth and so forth. So um, it's a very exciting story and uh, something that I look back. To with the with the very fun heart. How many uh, people did you have when you very first began? Like, was it? I mean, did you start out with? I assume you didn't start out with twenty. No, we started out with three, and then it was four, and it's five, and it's six, and it's a seven, bit. nine, and then it's fourteen at once, and then it falls back to ten. And, you know, and then you grow a little bit more, then you resize, rearrange, and so forth. I mean, like, there's so a many. Lot of that. Forth. I mean, we're talking about seven years at this point. Like a lot of things happen in seven years. Oh, for sure. So, like you know, now where your studio is kind of like you know become you know very well established with like outsourcing, and you've got like a couple IPs. Like, what is your next step forward with that? Like, is it just you know the I besides you know the outsource work? Like, are you going to push forward with the IPs even more? I know you have your Orkin project coming up. Yeah. I mean that's that's the next big thing. That's something that I need to solve. Um, it's a it's still a mountain of work, but like I'm I'm on, I feel like I'm coming closer to finishing line. Um, that's why I felt so comfortable in, in showcasing the project because I, I I know I can get it done. Um, it's not. I mean like I'm I'm fifty percent done at this point. So uh, it's a good it's a good point in time to share it and like start getting people excited about it. But. Um, yeah, this is the, the, the next big thing and potentially, I, I mean, I hope I can get into a rhythm where every two years or maybe even shorter, 18 months or so, I can, I can present a new thing um, that is completely different than the last one. I mean, that is my, that is my, my, my biggest hope. Like, I really want to juggle the things that I, that I have lying around and, and try completely different genres, completely different topics, completely different media. Um, and, and really see how far I can stretch my own creativity uh, uh, by just, you know, being, being experimental. Yeah, that's a good way to keep it fresh and kind of keep you motivated as well. Like, oh, that's, uh, um, you want to tell people a little bit about your working project? I don't really know much about it, to be honest. Oh, we, haven't really, we haven't really said anything about it. Oh, okay. All right. So it's, it's, in a very, it's in a very secret stage right now. But, oh, okay. I got gotcha. you. Um, well, no, I it's a, any pressure. It's obviously it's not an RPG at this point. It's a big storybook. Um, it's uh, full of world building. It's like um, uh, a lot of a lot of really informative background information. Um, uh, we came up with a really nice story that we think is worth telling. Um, that we think is relevant, um, and that we want to explore in a very unique fashion um so um it's several books at this point um and they're all interlinked with each other so to get the whole story you need to read all the books um and uh, that's the that's the exciting part about it and then hopefully if we get everything done and right then there will be also some audio 
um, uh, to a company. Yet. And, um, it's a very exciting thing. I'm, I'm very, very proud of this project because it's a, it's a completely different approach than, than the Genesis. And um, I really felt like I needed something that is, you know, easier to grasp and easier to understand for an, an outside audience. Um, yeah, it's a nice shift. Yeah. Like the Genesis is super rich and very convoluted, very thick, and it's like. If you if you enter that world, it's like almost like you have to leave your soul at the door uh, if you want to understand. Yeah. It. Um, and, and Orkin has a completely different mindset in terms of in terms of development. I just want to get the the, the, the layers of thickness, spread them apart, and you know, like really show a concise story that can be witnessed through the eyes of a of a of several protagonists actually, but. Uh, they will open up like a, a, a larger window into the world at uh, a later point in time. No, that's interesting. It's a, I mean, I like a lot of the design work that I saw for it. It looks like a, a very different, like, you know, genre shift, like you said, from a degenesis and even like what I would normally expect from something like you know, titles of Orc. And so the first thing I thought it was Orc. So I was like, this isn't what I would have expected, but it had like a lot of really cool, uh, you know, inspiration in there. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm really shooting for something. Uh, fresh and, and and inspired here, and I, I really hope it will uh, live up to what I'm promising right now. Yeah, I Actually, think, uh, community yeah. question about the the Orkin too. Uh, Joseph Weston was wanting to know, uh, like, what were you thinking about when designing the the orcs for Orkins? Because it seems like the the human faction is like hyper order and sort of authoritarian. Are the orcs like a response to that? Well, my my my, my first my first my very first thought is. Or was is just a simple question. How how can I make orcs sexy and appealing to <laughs> a mature audience that doesn't look at, at them as you know pig people with tusks? Um, so that that was the, the very first question. And I think as a as a conceptual artist, you know, like I, I really need to figure out how to make shit look cool and uh, certain. Certain things inspire me a lot, especially when they have been perceived or created in a certain way for a very long period of time. Orcs have always been created as this rather immature, brutish, um, you know, childhood fantasy of a raging Hulk uh, with wild hair. And so, how do you how do you bring that to a level of sexy? How do you make that interesting? How do you how do you tell a different story with the material that you have? Um, how do you change the perception towards that particular, you know, tribe or race or fantasy uh, people um, that has been so established in fantasy and pop culture for such a long period of time and you just spin a different story out of it. And it's not about reinventing the wheel, it's actually about rethinking the wheel, you know, just rethinking the, the entire process and, and then starting to create something, something new out of that. Uh, it's there's you know you've got to limit yourself from the very beginning and just say you work with a very shallow or very, very small framework and within that framework you don't have a lot of wiggle room but then when you can actually bend it to a certain direction and create something really interesting out of it or something really unique out of it then you're like oh great this is everybody's going to understand this and, or people in general are going to be be you know affected by it because it's 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 within that limit of perception. It is a new spin on a certain thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that was kind of like what you mentioned earlier, where like you know some of the uh, well, and not try to like glorify the idea, of course, but like the really creative idea comes down to like a simple statement mm -hmm. or a uh, you know just couple couple sentences or whatever so you know if you're trying to create something that's cool you can condense it like you said make a more of a simple simple framework and then just give it a direction and explore out yeah for sure uh well we're about like i mean i think now's a good time where you could do the screen share if you like and we can uh you, know, you can do a little drawing or something we can just talk about oh, what's going cool. through your brain pan <laughs> uh are you getting this? Yes. Okay. Jesus. 
I haven't drawn with audience in a long time. I don't even know if I can still do this. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's, also, it's also super late, so you know, don't, yeah, don't. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. You already kept me up, so you know. <laughs> Let me just see what I can do. This one's good. Let me find my brushes. Are, are you okay with like answering any other questions? Absolutely. Yeah, just go for it. Like, just ask whatever you want. I actually had a like an additional question on like when you were starting the studio, was there like a like could you just like describe like maybe some of the anxieties of like trying to get like a building, like a space and everything? Like what was that like? Like from like the logistics side of it? Oh, that was really easy because the first studio was in the apartment building where uh, I already lived. So we're just downstairs. <laughs> so it was really it was really accessible. Um, and uh, it just um, made things a lot easier, but then eventually, like we grew out of that space after a year and a half, and um, then from that point onward, like it's just been growing bigger, and you just have to do more budget planning, and you have to, you know, put more money aside, and you, you but you get used to all of that, you know, like numbers are numbers, you just put more zeros behind it. After a while, it just, uh, uh, you know, all feels the same. It doesn't make a difference if you're, you know. So just start, start simple and expand. You're still, I mean, like you're still paying it. Like it doesn't, it just doesn't matter. You still have to run a budget. Um, and if you run a good budget, and everything is fine. So I guess initially it was probably more about like finding the right people than worrying about the space. Especially I guess considering that so much of it is online with like a lot of outsourcing with client work and things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, like, I, we were fortunate from the beginning because I had a career to, you know, base off the first uh, rounds of client work, and um, it was rather easy to get, like, enough enough work in, in the first uh, few years. We had, like, a depression during, during 2013 where things weren't working out at all. That was, like, three years in, um, and a lot of planning went, you know, um, uh, a soft Work, but then eventually, you know, we rebounded and regrew our team and um, came came out stronger out of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, go sorry, ahead. go ahead, Trent. No, no, go on. Okay, yeah, I've got a couple of community questions. One, I got two for you. One's kind of funny, and then the other one's like a more <laughs> legitimate question. The first one is, uh, how many uh, cigarettes do you smoke a day? <laughs> I've been smoking three packs a day for the past almost, let's say, 25 years, maybe. Man. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> All right. And then the, uh, the actual technical question is, um, uh, what are some of your favorite uh, sources for, like, historical reference? Any favorite books, favorite museums, that sort of thing? Uh, I mean, I love, I love my good old uh, Pergamon Museum in Berlin. I love old school Angus McBride books um, from Osprey Publishing. They were amazing. Um, I mean, there's so much, there's so much good stuff out there. But I mean, also just you know, uh, uh, reading up on a historical period. Like for example, when I when I when I started doing research for work, and I I read through um, the entire letters um, that Cortes wrote to the the, the King of Spain. From uh, from Mexico um, mm -hmm. uh, during the conquest against the Aztecs because they really needed to read up on on a lot of a lot of that material. Um, I really felt like there was a um, I had a I had a maybe a cultural gap in there that I wanted to be filled, um, and so uh, I started reading up on that and I went over to you know the the Soto expeditions and. Uh, other expeditions that failed, and um, then reread Pizarro, and then from that point onward, then you're starting to understand the grander scope of that historical aspect, and you're starting to search for specific things. And when you're searching for specific reference, for specific ideas, for specific costumes, then you are specifically knowing about that historical aspect, and you're specifically also understanding that historical aspect. So you kind of save the the knowledge that you gain in a different part of your brain, and you make it use of, uh, reusable later on when you when you actually when you're in need of it. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, and especially like, I mean, is there anything like like this is I guess from me like is there anything specific that like when I like in choosing like your resources like do you have like anything that you are immediately drawn to, or do you just I don't know maybe if I have like any channels or podcasts you like to listen to and pick up ideas from that. I don't know. Uh, actually, no. I, like I enjoy silence the most. Like, I think I'm the most creative when, when it's complete silence around me. I also, I mean, I do listen to music sometimes, but like I'd rather not. But at certain days, like certain days, I'm just like I, I just enjoy having absolutely nobody around, not yeah. hearing sound because I feel like it's such a. You know, I hear I hear people chatting and talking all day and playing music all day. Like it's like this. This moment in time where I'm, I just want to be feeling like complete solitude because I feel like it's uh, I'm at the most creative in, in those moments. Yeah, yeah definitely. Your own distractions purely in your own zone. Yeah. And then and I normally I normally do not reference until I really need to reference. So, like for example, I will go for as far as I need to go or can on my 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 knowledge that I have of a certain subject. But then, once I've run out of out of knowledge on how to really prepare it, how to make it happen, how to you know um, define it in a in a better way, then I will look at reference and then we'll try to understand um, that particular aspect. But I won't use it necessarily to you know uh, draw from it or to slap it on top of something. But I will use it to you know understand it at that very point in time because the is again a very specific search. I need to understand the specifics of a certain thing, and then I, I I spend time trying to understand it and trying to be able to reutilize it at a at a later point in time. Yeah, I really like that uh, mentality. Like it's it's a similar thing that I, I think of when I'm working because like I, I like to keep the initial idea pure and work on it without looking at anything first, and then like I go and find like if it was armor or something, then I'll go and look at references to expand on it and make it more functionally like accurate but like i feel like if you start with reference first sometimes you lose like the purity of the idea like what makes it yours yeah yeah, yeah. That happens. That happens a lot. reference right. is more of a supplementation than a uh a crotch i suppose or i i don't know what well not a crutch but yeah i get it basically so what uh what's going through your head right now with the initial like with your sketch exactly like uh, there's a couple questions here that was like do you visualize you know your drawing before right now, you know what's going through my head i hope i don't fuck up in front of the audience like that's, <laughs> that's going through my head like um I, I don't know really i i just try to be gestural in those in those very beginning moments and by gestural i mean like capture a certain emotion a certain idea a certain way of presenting something iconic um and really i'm not i'm not thinking about anything right now i'm not thinking about lighting i'm not thinking about value i'm not thinking about background like the first thing is you know like something to spark me to keep on working on this idea uh, otherwise i'm just gonna get bored and start something else and then only at a later stage i'm looking at other at other aspects of of the image as I come across, if I like it enough, if it's uh, you know strong enough of an image. Um, but for me, like the first initial things that I'm I'm trying to solve are just basic proportion, basic mood, basic you know um, anatomy, basic you know appearance and design of the character, um, and then everything else comes at a later stage. Yeah, that was uh, actually something I was going to ask you about earlier because, like you said, you initially you were initially like a, a traditional guy when you're working with pencils a lot, and yeah. you know you said you didn't really do like a whole lot with color. Um, oh, actually, I mean, I didn't pick up digital drawing until I think 2013. Like I was still in the first couple of years of Six Month Vodka, but I was still drawing all my all my concepts in pencil. Um, it wasn't until 2030 that I switched over. So it's only been like, what, four years now, me drawing digitally. Um, because I just, I, like, I just get more things done uh, when, I, when I draw digitally. That was the reason why I switched over. Um, I just get a whole lot of work done. 
and I, like, I, I leave out the scanning aspect and I can, you know, colorize something relatively quick, quickly. Um, and, you know, I can capture an idea also very quickly in, in, in um, different explorative styles. So that is the, that is the main reason why um, I switched over, but like it's, um, it's only been four years. Yeah. I imagine that like your, you know, background in drawing like helped like not only the transition to digital, but the, tra the, the transition to, uh, um, you know, working with color that much more because like you know you were like I, I remember seeing like a lot of your pencil stuff and then like when you initially started stepping into uh painting i feel like that may have maybe been much easier since you knew like more what you were doing structurally well maybe but i don't know like i i got into painting so late and i also don't think i really ever mastered it like i've, I've always been very humble about my my paintings because i just feel incredibly um, you know, simple and, and hacked together. Um, like my, my approach to painting is not very sophisticated, I would say. Like it's, uh, a lot of times it's much more, you know, coloring stuff in and uh, blending it together a little bit and, you know, um, any sort of, of color knowledge or, um, you know, uh, uh, any, any proper, you know, mixing or anything that's happening. I, I, I'm just really not good at it. I've always been much more of a, of a line guy and uh, uh, avoiding volumetric shapes uh, for a good part of my life. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like I, I have like a similar similar background where I didn't touch like any color or anything like that. So that's why I was curious as to just what you because I always felt like I was. I always did like the typical cookie cutter thing where it was like sketch, ink it, color it. <laughs> so that was kind of like. I mean, I, for example, I can't build up anything that looks like, you know, like anything um, just going straight for volumetric shapes. Like I can't, I just simply can't. Like, I, like there's no way, way in hell I can just paint a face without, without an understructure to it. I need the drawing first. I need to have like the, um, the, the strength of the drawing established before I can do anything else um, um, with with a particular piece. That makes a lot of sense. Let's see. How to... Let's see. We have a couple of community questions. Um, Charlie uh, Homanaj wants to know uh, about your uh, six more Vaca workshops that you do around the world. He's, he's curious if you're planning uh, to do more of those and if like you're planning on perhaps reaching as far as South America. Oh geez, we haven't done one in like what seven years, I think. Like, uh, uh, when was the last workshop that we've done? I think in 2010. Um, <laughs> I, I have no plans of workshops right now. There's just so much work. Like, you, like I'm just organiz uh, organization and, and preparing and booking flights and making sure you get enough attendees and you you know sell out and all this stuff. Like, I'd rather leave that to somebody else. Like, let other people do workshops and organize them. I'd gladly come as a guest and, and teach for a minute, but like organizing them ourselves is, is a nightmare. Like I can imagine a million better things to do than organizing a workshop. Gotcha. Yeah, Sorry for yeah. disappointing in that respect, but like I just really don't see myself ever going through that again. It's just so much hassle. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this guy's name, so I'm not going to try, but uh, someone's uh, curious about uh, uh, how has your approach to uh, like design changed compared to like 10 years ago versus like what you're doing now? In what way? Can you, can, can you elaborate a little bit more on this? I was uh, just curious, I guess, like how your like approach to, to designing things like versus like, t I guess, 10 years ago versus like how you approach now, like has, has it changed much or? I mean, 10 years, I'd say it changed a lot. Yeah, I imagine. Maybe. I mean, it better, I mean, it better <laughs> change, otherwise I shouldn't be working anymore. Like, I should be, you know, be moving a coffin or something. Like, I, I, I hope it changed. I hope it changed enough for the better, mm -hmm. because if it didn't, like, I would be ashamed right now. Um, I don't know, how did it change? Like, you, you think my mindset, like, the things that I take in, or is, what are you, what are you trying to ask about? 
I think that the person's just kind of asking what we talked about earlier, really, and where it was just like, uh, you know, how you, you, how your mind is working when you're talking about designing things, but really you kind of already answered that with taking something and be like, how do I make works look sexy? You know, like combining with the statements and kind of, you know, expanding from there. It seems like, I, I think that's like the general, and, and it can, I mean, I, I don't mean to like, you know, speak for your mindset, of course, but I think that could be like anything where, you know, you could take something completely unrelated, you know, it could be like orcs and skateboards and then all of a sudden you have a new genre. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, maybe that's a decent way to think about it. Could so, you uh, tell us how you uh, came up with the, uh, the name for you guys' studio? Oh, that is such an old story, and I've, I, I've told it, I think, a million times already. Uh, it's the last thing that two of my best friends, Andrew Jones and Cora Kaufman, remembered after a night of drinking with me in uh, a bar in Amsterdam, and it was me just ordering six more vodka over and over again uh, at the bar. Like, that was, like, the last thing that they, they kind of memorized, and they made so much fun of. Of, of me the next day because it was, it was such terrible alcoholic and everybody had a terrible hangover uh, and nobody could walk anymore and uh, legs and muscles were hurt and uh, I felt like it was such a pun by itself and it like had like such, so many different connotations as to what it could be that I felt like if I ever going to do something with my life then uh, you know it's going to be called sex and because it's a, you know it's like an open canvas of interpretation like you know, what do we do? We don't do, we don't produce vodka, obviously, just do some concert art, but, you know, like, it leaves you, it leaves the room to do whatever you want with it, you know, like you can build a piece off of it or a clothing line or, uh, you know, you can uh, uh, open up a shop for healing stones or whatever else you want to do with that name. I, I think as a brand, it's really strong because it has no, no definitive meaning. Yeah, it can work with pretty much anything. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to do was like call this company anything that you know is related to art. You know, you just imagine something like Art Studio X Y Z or so. Like, oh, um, I was uh, I was always um, you know despising an idea like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I totally get where you're coming from with that. I mean, especially if you just said like Six More Vodka Art Studio, like you don't. I, I personally wouldn't want to limit your po like you wouldn't want to limit your possibilities like of what you could do in the future because you're always expanding, you're always growing. So yeah, I mean, like who knows if this is going to be an art studio in ten years? Maybe we'll try to do something completely different, repair motorcycles or something. You know, like I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to have a dream that you know, you know has nothing to do or has just to do with one particular industry. Mm. So out of all the things that you've done, like already, like what, what would you say is like one of the huge things on your list that you haven't done yet? Like, uh, you know, make your own film. I don't know. Well, I mean, I've done, I've done quite a bit. Like, I, I feel like, I feel like what I need to focus on in the next few years is really being honest with myself as to, you know, continuing to create my own stuff. I, I really want to, do as much personal work as possible. I really feel this is something that I've not done enough. I mean, like if you look at the the, the length of my career, um, that we're talking about like 21 years in, in the grinder, um, and out of those 21 years, I've only been spending about four really trying to cap, catch up with with all the all the stuff that I really want to talk about, or all the all the stories that I want to tell. So. It's a it's a very small amount of time in comparison to how long my career has been, and I feel like the next couple of years I really want to spend on on being as creative as possible for myself and for my own well being because I really feel it's a it's a necessity it's a it's a it's a longing it's an urge that I have to produce as much personal work as possible because I really think you know um, that that's my main goal that's why I got into this industry in the first place. Uh, so what uh, makes me absolutely happy is to be to be my own director um, and to approve my own things, and, uh, my own stories. Like that's that's and that consists of everything. That consists of 
not just drawing and design, but it consists of writing as well. I've been doing a lot more writing with, uh, with, with age. Um, sure, I would love to try out more, uh, more different media. Like I would love to see how it feel, feels to do, you know, anything longer than a trailer in terms of direction. Um, I'm, I'm always curious about stuff like that, but like really my, my main urge is like to, to, to combine art and writing into a bigger and better product and whole and uh, see where I can spin stories and who I can inspire with these stories and how many creatives I can actually reach to become part of, of the stories that uh, I, I try to invent. Nah, I think that, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think that's the ultimate goal for any artist really is to, you know, have that complete creative freedom to express their ideas. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, uh, I have actually an interesting question about six more vodka. Um, I said, uh, what does it take for someone to work there? Does it, let's say start as an intern or junior, any advice on that? Okay, so this is this is a really good question, and I think I, I haven't talked in public enough about it. So we we did have a few situations in the past, and I mean by a few, it's nothing more than a handful, where an intern would get to the point where he would be you know hireable. Normally, our intern program is only three months long, um, and you know we. Um, we try to find good or interesting interns that are promising by themselves already that in the process of them being here, they might succeed at you know, becoming better, better artists and showing potential for a proper employment position. But this is not something that happens regularly and this is not something that you can bank on as an intern. Um, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Most of the time it doesn't. Most of the time, um, you know, you you have a good time with the intern for the three months that the person is here uh, and then you say goodbye to each other and wish each other luck you know that's um, that's how it normally goes um, but there are certain scenarios where interns have shined and completely surprised us in and shown themselves from their from their absolute best angle um, and became highly valuable assets in, in that respect. So, um, got hired into a junior position, um, got a full-time job overnight, pretty much, uh, and stayed with us. And, and those moments are like the, the most successful ones, the, 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 the ones where you as, a, as an employer are really feeling you've done something right uh, and things are coming together uh, in, in the best possible fashion when somebody succeeds like that. That's like the, 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 the most, um, I mean, the, the happiest moment that you can go through as a, as a company owner uh, is seeing a young guy succeed. Yeah. In general, the application to junior position goes as with, you know, a lot of other companies out there. We do, we check portfolios. If the portfolio is strong enough for a junior position, then we uh, call for a first interview just to meet each other, just to get to know each other, see if, you know, there's any any you know bad chemistry in the air or something we do a proper phone or a skype interview lasts about an hour and then if that interview goes well then we give out an art test and the art test is rather complicated with some high demands on the art test um and uh, if that goes well if the art test goes well then we call for a follow-up and then on the follow-up interview we see if we really want to work together with that person. And if that's the case, um, yeah, then you know we're ready, and uh, the senior might have found his position. Uh, but normally, what we do is we have always we have um, several people that we're interviewing at the same time, and so while the people are you know performing on their art test, they're actually also competing against other people that we have um, as potential artists in, in, um, in our state. And the, the, the people who perform the best obviously get picked. And that means performing not just as an artist, but also performing 
for other well and soft skills like showing interest in, in the company and showing some sort of investment in this place. Uh, so it makes sense for us to hire even more because like the last thing that we want is you know to bring somebody on who's just a good artist but paying the ass to work with. Um, so yeah that's the, the, the general the general rule of thumb. Yeah, so basically it's more just like pure interest in the company in itself and like, you know, how hard you willing to work, like how much do you want it kind of thing. Well, you know, like there's people who want to come here just to have it on their resume and then, you know, like that's the people you need the least because they're the ones that are going to be out of the door as soon as they get a better offer. Um, you know, it's just um, the, the way it is. So like I, I, I don't want to necessarily you know, build somebody up and put a lot of effort into into teaching everything that we do and know just to see him go when he could be the most useful for the team, you know? Um, just at the point where, where he gets good and then he just says, fuck you, I'll, I'll go work for the next guy. That's a, that's a failed investment for, for any employer or any studio out there. Um, I mean, that just causes bad blood and burns bridges and it's not a, it's not a good mindset to be in. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, at this stage in like uh, in your career, do you still have like a, a strong like study regiment, or like how how any like how often do you like how much time do you spend doing like more technical studies? I'm not a really good study guy. I've never studied in in, in that respect except for my really really early teens around like 13, 14, where I would draw out of an anatomy book like. I, I'm not a guy that runs a sketchbook. I've never run a sketchbook. I've never gone to museums to draw certain things. Um, it's just not my cup of tea. It's not what I want to do. It's not who I am. So I, really, I really enjoy the process of drawing by itself the most. And I think I learned the most by just challenging myself with any kind of illustration that I, I, I have to deal with. You know, like this could be anything, you know, like be it be it something that I'm doing for this podcast or something that I'm doing in my lunch break or something that is just an idea that I want to capture really quick that, that is studying for me. For me, like the output is what counts. It's not the, the subject that counts. Gotcha. So you mainly like to just kind of like work on things that like you would have like interest in, like your actual own creative ideas. I mean, like, the, for me, the process of drawing is so important. It doesn't matter if I'm studying or, or, or drawing. Like, what is, like, it doesn't make a difference for me. For me, that is irrelevant. Um, it's irrelevant what I'm drawing as long as I'm drawing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, like, rather than just be convoluted saying I have to study this, 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 just draw, and you know, the more you draw, the better you get. So, yeah, so we can work up over, over things such as, you know, like, oh, have I studied enough this week? Uh, did I draw enough legs or did I draw enough elbows or stuff like that? It's just like irrelevant. As long as you're drawing, you're drawing. Um, it's like the best thing that can possibly happen is for you to just keep on drawing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. On a more technical side here, is it, do you usually like to work with like a minimal number of, of layers to like more like, I guess? Yeah, yeah I, I do that. I do that. Quite a bit. Um, I try to keep it keep it together, but you know, since you know we're doing a presentation, I'm, I'm not really paying attention right now. Yeah, I was just yeah. curious because, like, with like such a strong like traditional background that you have, primarily working with with like pencil, where you know, like, with digital, you know, you can make a lot of like mistakes or not have to like be so meticulous about like the structure because you can correct on the fly. Like I was, I was just curious, like if you like to work with like more minimal amount of layers, just to kind of, you know, be like a little closer to your traditional roots. Well, it really depends. It really depends on what I'm going for. Right, right now, it's just, um, you know, it's just all show. Um, if I if I was planning this picture out properly, it would be probably a little bit different. Mm. I actually remember uh, you were talking about. Um, on the stream that I listened to, you were talking about having to do like a couple comic issues and whatnot. And you said you haven't really like, you don't really study much. You just, you know, draw like, how, how did you, 
like learn a lot about, you know, doing page layouts and things like that. Like that's that it's a specific interest. Oh, I, honestly, I hacked it. <laughs> I, I don't know anything about it. Like I think I, I uh, what's his name? I uh, the guy who did like the the, the books about comics. Um, Scott McLeod, I think, is his name. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, the uh, Understanding Comics book. Exactly. I think I read those three, and that was it. And everything else, I, I just made up on the fly. Like I've been I've just been like a, good to go. <laughs> I've, been I've, been a terrible, I've been a terrible hack when it comes to that. I, I, I'm good at faking things. <laughs> oh, apparently, apparently, you're faking things, except for you know, it gets by with you know, people think that's like a, how you actually do it. So, I mean, I guess literally just you know, when it comes to you know, studying or trying to improve a specific skill, just do the thing and don't worry so much about it. Right? Yeah, and I mean, like you can learn so much from from movies and. and Movie stills, and I've, I've I've jumped out on movies so so many for so many years. You know, like uh, there's a lot of a lot of pop culture knowledge that I probably carry around that I, I just have instinctively or intuitively, you know, uh, included in my work. But I I've, I've been I mean like I I'll say it as it is. I've been a hack all my life when it comes to certain things. You know, like I've um, I faked it uh, uh, more often than than not, you know, um, but not out of a bad intention, but you know, just because some things need to get done and sometimes you need to get the job done. And you don't have time to think or to research. You just need to trust your guts and just go with it. Um, and it just jump right in the water, yeah, and see if you can swim. <laughs> uh, it doesn't come from a bad place or a place of arrogance. It just comes from a place of you know, like I, I don't have the time to figure this out now. Uh, but what I need to do is I need to figure it out. I, I don't have I don't have any other options. So like, what am I going to do? Um, what am I going to do? I, I think that's actually like one of the best ways to learn. Sometime is just like backing yourself into a corner and saying, "Okay, I, I have to legitimately perform this now. Like, I, I don't have any options. You know, maybe I I don't have the the training or whatever. But like, this could be the ultimate learning experience in of itself. Just like actually making a genuine attempt at it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was something I've been thinking a lot about lately as well. When it comes to you know, you you can you can stack up this like ensemble of books that will tell you how to do that, like every skill on the planet. But you know, if you go back to the caveman days where you know you have no books, you have no nothing, you have, you know walls and like rocks and sticks and you know everything else. Nobody knew anything until somebody figured it out. And the best way to figure something out is just to do it. Yeah, just pure experimentation. Yeah, yeah. that is correct. Uh, we got a pretty good community question here from uh, Stephen uh, Zapata. He, uh -huh. He's curious about, um, like, with your like full like illustration work, like, how how long would you say uh, on average does it take you to like finish uh, like one of those pieces? And when you're doing those pieces, do you like to work straight through them to finish, or do you do you take breaks often when you when you work? Well, it depends on what kind of finish he's looking for. Is he looking for like a you know, like a drawing with a bunch of colors, or is he like asking for a specific painting? I think he's uh, like uh, curious about like like a fully like rendered out painting. I mean, like it really depends on. I, I think there's like so many factors. That it depends on like what mood am I in? <laughs> well, how much time do I have uh, to really ponder over it? Am I hungry? Am I not hungry? Um, you know, like there's like so many there's so many factors. Like I I've, I've done paintings in a day, and I've done paintings that looked simple to start with, but then like just took forever to figure out in several levels. Um, it's, it really always it always depends. It always depends on so many outside factors. And it's impossible to say what the actual time frame is. I mean. Um, Sometimes I have a really clear idea where I'm going. Sometimes I just meander around and it takes forever to get started. Sometimes I have like a really strong lighting situation from the get go and I'm able to block the, the masses in really fast. And sometimes I struggle with like the simplest shit. And I just forget like what I knew, what I feel like I knew yesterday. So. Uh, it, it really, it really, really depends. And there's 
honestly, it's too many factors to just say for sure or for certain. But I can tell you, in general, I work pretty fast. Like I do, I do uh, high speed runs like this one, where like I try to establish at least the core of an image within 45, 50 minutes. Um, so I can just get the idea out there. And then once the idea is there, then the proper planning can begin later on, you know, and I can, you know, look at all the inconsistencies and just try to develop it off of, um, uh, off of there. Yeah, that makes yeah sense. that's typically what I find is like with most like artists, like it's, it's more of a case by case basis. Like it, you know, it just depends on so many different variables, how long a particular piece will take. Yeah, I, I mean, it's really, it's absolutely impossible for me to say. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, like I would, I would just ramble something that is not true. <laughs> yeah, like every piece takes me three hours, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, crap, like that doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, going back to your like time at Marvel, I'm, I'm just curious, was there like a particular like, uh, like IP that you worked on from Marvel that like you really like, gra like enjoyed, like that was like a, like maybe a favorite of yours, like just out of curiosity? I mean, like, we, we spoke about this a little bit earlier before the interview started, but like, I really enjoyed, like, honestly, I would say I really enjoyed the obscure titles the most. Um, the stuff that, you know, nobody else wanted to touch, that was always, like, something I was really, really inspired by. Um, uh, I mean, no-name titles like Blade and stuff, that, that was a thing, that was a thing that really kicked my ass. I felt like I was really free to explore whatever whatever I wanted to do, um, because nobody was giving a fuck about that particular character. Um, and so I was pretty free to just explore and, and go nose deep into my own, own direction on, on these things. So I, I really liked those, those stunts. Um, everything that wasn't a fan favorite, everything that wasn't like, you know, uh, something that any other artist wanted to draw more than anything else was really interesting to me. On the uh, on the other end of that spectrum, was there like a, a, like any characters that were like you know so celebrated that you were almost kind of intimidated or perhaps maybe slightly daunted to to work on? I wasn't intimidated by them as much as I was bored by it. Like because I like one point like what are you going to say about? The character like Spider-Man that any other artist had that is great hasn't said it already. Like the big characters have been drawn by pretty much everybody who's relevant in the art world. So uh, unless you really feel you can bring something new to the table, why even bother? Like if you're not going to be able to, you know, um, make it better, then why even put the effort in? Like that that just always seemed very obscure to me and. Uh, I never really understood that concept properly. So um, I, I really never liked working on the big characters. I always preferred like the, the no-name guys and uh, the stuff that nobody else wanted to touch. Stuff where you had like a lot more flexibility to kind yeah, of... Yeah, because like, nobody really cared what the outcome would be. And like, people had much less of, a, of an inclination to you know, um, tell you how to do things. Um, and that that really gives a lot of a lot of creative freedom. That really really frees you up to you know just explore things that you've never done before. So yeah, we got a community question uh, asking um, like when when you were drawing as a kid, were your uh, friends and family pretty supportive about it, or did you face no. any like, negative feedback from them or anything no, of that nature? Nobody supported, nobody supported this. Nobody supported this. They weren't interested at all, and yeah, you know, like this was uh, something that never was never a part of my household or never part of my my early social life, and I, that gave me a lot of headache um, early on. But like you grow, you grow out of that. And you just keep on doing it. You realize that there's others out there, you know, that do the same thing, and it's cool. It's cool now. Now I look back at those times, and you know, I eventually. We'll meet an old friend and he'll find out what I'm doing and he'll be like, oh, I always knew you'd make it. And you'd be like, no, you didn't. Like, 
what are you talking about? Like, you're just making this shit up right now. Like, you, you never believed in me. So, it's like, oh, yeah, so now you're on board. <laughs> you know, like, it's just this weird way of, like, they're, they're trying to, like, rewrite history on you. Um, and it's just really annoying where you're like, oh, man, just stop, don't say anything anymore. Like, this is not, this is not true. Um, so, no, it wasn't, it wasn't supportive at all. Yeah, that's never, I think that's never easy for most people growing up, just like not a lot. I mean, there, there are some people who are kind of been blessed with that scenario, but like, you know, for others, it's a, I don't know, I guess more of a passion just to be like, oh, you know, this is something I just have to do. And you know, honestly, that can be more of a driving force than anything, you know, to be like, oh, well, you know, be like kind of like Rocky, you know, I don't have any support, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of have to see it like that. So uh, at this stage in your drawing, like where, what is it that's kind of going through your mind besides like, you know, maybe I mean, right now I just, I mean, I blocked, I blocked them in, uh, the base colors that I want to use down. So right now I'm just going to throw a multiply over him, um, just to get a base gradient into, into the form. So I can go ahead then and just, you know, start lighting him. Uh, mm. So with, depending on like the type of drawing or painting that you do, like is your process always the same? And it's just like, oh, I only, I go this far when it comes to painting or do you take different, I mean, obviously you always go with like a line sketch first, I think, right? Yeah, I mean like that's a, that's my basic, my basic approach. Mm -hmm. uh, is to draw it all off first because I really need to, I really need to understand where I'm going before I'm doing anything. Um, but then eventually, you know, like once once that is established, like really depending on on, on my mood of the day, like I will do I will do different um, different experiments and try out different things and uh, try to solve an image in a, in a different fashion depending on, on on really what I want to do or what I have in mind or. Uh, where I think the, the thing can be going, um, it 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 just it just varies so often. Um, I don't have like a strict method of solving problems or a certain rule set by which I play all the time. I just really like figuring things out and trying new things, um, you know, as I come across uh, problems. More of like an organic approach, then, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. Exper experiment and wing it. Yeah, I mean, like as I said, like I, I faked it more often than not, and this comes basically from you know like being experimental, and like trying to keep that uh, um, that part of your brain active. Let's see, uh, someone's I, asking, um, do you ever do any uh, like uh, photo bashing or anything of that nature? And what's your like general thoughts on that? Or do you prefer to like keep it strictly, you know? simple with just you know you and your brushes this is such a funny question so like at any at any at any uh interview that i'm doing like somebody will come up and ask the photo matching question so um no i don't i don't do it and it's not because i don't like it or people shouldn't be doing it it's not because i think it's a bad way to do it i don't think there's any there's anything wrong with you doing it there's nothing wrong with you doing it um, we, as a company, we just don't sell that kind of artwork. Like it's an economical question. We sell a different kind of artwork. Um, we sell artwork that is developed from the drawing stage all the way ground up and helps us to you know, keep our pipeline as artists together. And the only way for us to keep our pipeline is if everybody on the team knows what they're doing at every point in time. So. That they when they have to switch over to an image, they know exactly what to do with it. So there is not a single aversion towards that kind of art that I ever had. Uh, but people think I'm averted towards it because we don't hire people who do that predominantly or who depend on it to finish a picture. There's nothing wrong with you doing it if that's the way you like to do art. Do it as much as you can. I, I don't. I don't care. 
that we don't care. But it's nothing that we can hire for because we don't need it. We just don't need that kind of artwork in our portfolio. We don't need those kind of artists that are dependent on it. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're bad artists. It just means that we can't use that kind of artwork. Yeah, that's what the look you're going for. So, you know, like if you're selling screws and somebody comes to you and is a ballad dancer, it doesn't matter how good he dances the ballad, like you're still selling screws. And we're, we're a very simple studio. We have like just one kind of service that we offer and that is draw cool pictures. Um, and <laughs> most of the time they're drawn. And painted, and but they're drawn. They always have a drawing base in some sort of way. So um, for for us to be able to hire somebody on board that is in some sort of dependent on photo bashing or on three D bases, he has just a different way of solving problems. It's a different way of approaching an image. It's a different way of composing an image. Like he goes through different steps, and these steps are not the steps our guys go through or I go through. So in the, in, the, in the process of getting a picture done, like there would be a lot of hurdles and a lot of problems and stepping stones that we would have to overcome to get to a similar result or to a final result, which would make the team play very hard and very inefficient. Um, and that's yeah, kind of like break up the cohesiveness of like your pipeline. Exactly. And that's all there is to it. But if you want to photo bash, be my guest. You can do that till your eyes bleed. <laughs> is there a, a this is kind of a I guess a question away from drawing? But it says, do you have you ever taken like a long break or like you know do you ever like you know, the, you're running a studio? Do you ever get time for like a vacation or just time to yourself? Oh well, I do. I do a vacation once a year now. Uh, I finally started forcing myself to. It. But uh, um, you know, it's still too little. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, for sure. But uh, I mean, at least you keep like somewhat that that you gotta have a little bit of that balance there, I suppose. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, like I get really nerv I get really anxious when I, when vacation is too long. I, I feel uh, like I'm wasting my time, and I just want to go back home mm -hmm. and, start and, and be creative or something. I, I don't feel like. Um, uh, I'm of such a good use on a vacation for a long period of time. Yeah, that was something I was actually going to like ask you earlier. I know you don't get like you get very little time to yourself, but like what when you do get a small window, like do you, what do you like to do outside of that? Ah, oh, it's a really good question. What I like to do, I hate everything. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, seriously, I, I don't know. Like I do, I do enjoy helping a friend a lot. I do enjoy like small traditions that I've established over the years, like going to the same bar every Tuesday and getting hammered. Um, um, it's, it's like my it's like my start of the week edition, you know. Like um, it's barely Tuesday and you just get really fucking smashed. Um, yeah, I guess you in that mindset. <laughs> so. Um, I mean, like those those things. I, I enjoy the company of people a lot. I, I really, I have to say, like, I, I nothing makes me happier than having good 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 people around. Uh, and good people make me happy in general. So um, that's like something that I, I really like doing. Um, like talking to my friends for long periods of time, just being incredibly stupid, uh, <laughs> pulling random dad jokes. Um, the whole evening. Someone's curious about, um, like, in your career, like, uh, uh, whenever you hit like a low point, um, yeah, they're they're curious about, like, uh, how how do you go about like uh, moving past it? Like, has there ever been like a, a moment where you where you felt, I guess, like, just unsatisfied, perhaps, with your work, and it was like a struggle or anything of that nature? I mean, the the only the only answer I can give to that is that I'm constantly unsatisfied with my work and I never like what I produce so I keep producing so I you know I will finally reach that point where I'm not unsatisfied with my work anymore um, it's, it's just really what it is like I've never been happy with my work for longer than just a few mere days and I just feel like there's always something better that I could be doing um, and that's why I keep exploring that's why I keep 
working so much. Like, this is really the main motivation uh, um, when it comes to when it comes to uh, drawing and painting. It's just never feeling adequate enough, never feeling like I've done enough, never feeling like I've uh, achieved or accomplished enough. I always always feel like I need to do better. I need to perform better. I need to do more. I need to you know make sure that you know the next picture that I'm plotting out or planning out is more successful than the previous one. And, um, it's just it's just really what what drives and motivates me. Um, if I didn't have that, like I, I could have I could have given up a long time ago. Um, that's that's all there is. That makes a lot of sense. I mean I, I think that we all kind of every I mean most I don't know if I've ever met an artist that just was like completely satisfied with like everything that they did and just like, you know, doesn't want to move beyond like a certain, certain point being like, Oh no, I'm happy where I'm at. I mean, but it's good to be happy in the moment too, but at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Like there's, there's, there's moments that are highly enjoyable in, in, in an artistic career. Like I'm, don't get me wrong. Like it's not like I'm, I'm, I'm taking a whip and, and you know, um, uh, beating myself senseless, um, especially not after this interview. But like, like <laughs> it's a, there is a certain dissatisfaction that always comes with, you know, you knowing deep down inside. Okay, you can do this better. You can do this better. Don't use the cheap tricks that you used yesterday. Like, take a different angle. To do, do it, uh, take a different route. Um, challenge yourself different. Um, produce something. Uh, in a in a manner that you didn't do before, keep it exciting and so forth and so forth and so forth and then literally in in that in that respect grow as an artist and that that's all there is to it. Um, I, I wouldn't know what else to say except for for really listening to your gut and just constantly developing. Have you ever had like any like uh, I don't know any setbacks like any injuries or anything that prevented you from drawing for a good amount of time? Or? No, no, never, never, never had a stiff arm or anything. I've, I've been healthy you know, for the most part of my life. I mean, except for you know the occasional flu hits you. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> nothing, nothing that would render me. Uh, useless um, for for you know months or so. Yeah, I've heard of some people like you know having setbacks like wrist injuries and I don't know. Like, yeah, I, I, I met I met a fair share of artists in, in my time that like really had several big problems with you know their arms and, and motorics and whatever else. But like I, I've always been lucky when it comes to that. Like, I've never had any anything similar appear to me or happen to me. See everybody that's listening to this. No, he has had no setbacks, and he still smokes three packs a day. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's the truth. So, how far, like, you think? Well, like, what stage are you at with this drawing now, exactly? I mean, like, I I really don't have a plan where this is going, so I might just, you know wing it and start the next one. Um, at this point in time, I'll just, you know, leave it, leave it on my desk and maybe do something with it later. Um, uh, you is know. This, this is the general look for like a lot of your characters in Orkin, right? With the yeah. neon lines and stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I actually like that a lot. Like that's, uh, I, I like like the war painted kind of, well, it's like war painted, but I, I don't know how they're really Describe it. Where would you place that? Uh, uh, it's kind of, it reminds me of like a kind of like a tribal type of like thing, like aesthetic. Yeah, for sure. Cole, were you wanted to ask anything else about like a uh, you know studio question stuff? Like, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, we got a one community question. Um, I'm pretty sure I already know the answer, but uh, does a uh, six more vodka like ever uh, uh, take freelancers on, or is it strictly like an in-house studio? It's an in-house studio. Everybody is on payroll. And the reason for it is is that we're working on many, many, you know, big secret projects, and we just can't risk 
for the stuff to you know be handled yeah, by. like leak out yeah and the second thing is you know like freelancers are great people but they are also you know they're also career driven people so their commitment to a job might not be the same as a commitment that you know somebody has who is in house you know like we might be just one job of many jobs that freelancer is doing in a particular month and we might not get the same level of attention to a certain job that he's doing um, that he would potentially grant to a different project um, meanwhile. So like I, I, I never felt like we're getting the same kind of range and, and, and uh, strength out of the images that we're getting from uh, our, our internal guys already. So that's, that's why we never really went into the freelance route. Like we have the occasional situation, like for example, one of our seniors, Michal, he worked with us for a year and a half in house and then he moved back to Slovakia because his wife wanted to get uh, um, her second, uh, they wanted to get their second child back in Slovakia. And so we made, a, we made an exclusive freelancer deal where he does home office pretty much the entire year. Uh, but this comes out of experience just because we knew how he works, we knew how um, dependable he is and how responsible he is. So it was a no-brainer. We wanted to keep working with him, so we structured the deal where he can work from home as a freelancer. And, um, we have the safety of you know knowing how, how to handle it. Um, yeah, I was gonna say. I imagine there's like a little hesitation or something when it, when it involves like a freelancer, like you know that comes in like, hey, you know, because most like I guess they want most of the time it's like um, they would rather like have your name on the resume rather than like make it the long lasting, you know, really want to stick around. Yeah. So that, that's that's the reason why we prefer in-house guys, and also I mean, like communication travel is just so much faster in one room. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. sure. I mean, so, it makes a lot of sense, yeah, because like I get the sense with like how rigorous your like um, intern process and hiring process is. Like it, it seems like you're trying to build more of like a like a family, like within the studio of people that really like understand each other and get along with each other and, and have like, like, it all it all it all goes down to you know like. It's, it's, I mean, the, the mutual understanding just makes the quality of the art so much better. If you know, if you know what each particular artist is struggling with, then you know how to put like, the right people together to solve a problem. If you know what to oversee in a certain art, like in, in a certain artist's performance, then you know, you can react upon it relatively quickly. It just takes no time to just do a fix on somebody's machine on their Wacom and you know, like show them exactly how to fix the silhouette or how to how to improve, you know, the hand here or something. And it's just like a, such a small, um, small step during a, a, a normal day-to-day -day operation. But if you would try to relay that feedback to a freelancer who's outside of the company, then it's like an effort. You know, you need to set up a Skype call, and then you need to do a share screen, and then you need to explain it, explain yourself, and so forth and so forth. And maybe that person is not really used to that way of working and he's completely confused as to what you mean and then it's like a long-term discussion. And so like it's a huge investment to just get like something really simple fixed. Yeah, and I can imagine that would just completely like slow down the entire pipeline like development process and then you're delayed on, you know, what the like the goals of the day are and stuff. Like I, I completely like see the benefit of keeping everything in house and like having like a smooth train, like with the, with the work ethic and everything. Mm -hmm. Sure. That was something that I was going to ask real quick uh, about like, you know, working digitally. I mean, I see obviously primarily probably only use Photoshop, but have you ever worked with a clip paint studio or anything like that? Uh, clip paint studio. That sounds familiar. Isn't that the thing where you can draw perspective lines really nicely? Uh, it's like another painting program, except it has like a apparently like a smoother line efficiency or something than Photoshop does. It has like that built in. I don't know. I don't. I'm not sure how to describe it. I think, I think one of my guys, one of our our lead artists, um, Gerald, is using it from mm -hmm. time to time. But I think he only uses it for perspective grids and and similar stuff. I don't. I don't think he uses it for for mm -hmm. final polished images or anything. I think that's just mostly Photoshop. Gotcha. I was just curious. 
Well, man, I mean, I know it's getting pretty late there and we're at about the top of like two hours, uh, something that we do at the end of every interview that, uh, their you know, podcast that we do is like a, <laughs> uh, what would you say? Like just, the, yeah, I don't know, like closing words of wisdom kind of thing where it's like, what would you say to people that are, you know, working hard or, you know, other artists, like your word of advice for people that are, you know, I mean, you can excel at anything that you repeat over and over again, but like the main or the most important thing of like wanting to achieve something is to just stay authentic to yourself and hold yourself up to your own standards. Like just develop those standards for yourself. Just like try to be the best you can be for yourself and not for anybody else, and you'll succeed at it. I, I think it's just a matter of like, consistently hammering that into your head and not being afraid of failing and not being afraid of, you know, challenging yourself, but just to keep going, just to, you know, keep on developing in the right pace and in the right mindset. And not seeing, you know, the world as, as a place of competition, but as a place where you can prosper properly, um, especially in this industry, you know? Um, I think authenticity is something that is, is is exhibited too little nowadays and it's so often it's just what can be derivative of what else what is hip what is modern what is what is what is talked about what is interesting for a certain you know moment of time what is a trend how can i follow that trend how can i jump on that train something looks successful so how can i do this to become successful myself, it's a very, it's a very narrow-minded tun tunnel vision towards you know like what you should be doing. You should always ask yourself what you should be like. What would I do? What would I do if nobody else was looking at my shit? <laughs> what would I do if I had no friends on the entire planet? What would I do if I was like a single human being on Mars with you know a canvas? What what would I be drawing? Those, those are the things that you should be trying. Those are the things that you should be exploring. Those are the things that you're, uh, you know, um, the, the, that you're the most comfortable with probably and, and the, the things that are the most meaningful to you and that those are the things that you're really going to excel at. And if you excel at those, then you're authentic. I mean, that's, that's a very important mindset. Yeah, yeah, I can completely agree with that. And it's like a quick, quick random tangent that you kind of like touched on uh, a little bit earlier was like uh, the idea of like, you know, your limitation as an artist when in reality the, the, the biggest limitation is just your own fear to draw. Like that's kind of a, I don't know, like most people like, you know, they, they say, oh, but I have no, no, no experience with this. I can't do this, whatever. But in reality, like your biggest, uh, you know, weakness is just, the fact that you haven't sit down and actually like done it, you know, or, you know, so yeah. just, yeah, stop talking about it, sit down and do it. <laughs> there you go. You just said it. Yeah. Well, uh, everybody in the chat saying thanks so much for coming on and we really appreciate it. I know that we kept you up, you know, after hours and such, man. It's yeah. yeah. Sorry about that, Marco, but thank you so much for, you know, coming on and, and sharing some of your insight with us. Yeah, that, was, been, that was really nice. Thank you guys. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, man. And I uh, you know, wish you all the luck with all your projects and everything. Definitely be keeping an eye on it. Okay. I'll try. I'll try. I'll try to catch up with everything. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. everyone. We'll uh, catch you all next time. All right. Bye-bye.